Welcome to another video for General Science. In this video, we're going to be finishing up Chapter 14. We're going to be looking at simple machines. So the first question that we're going to discuss in this video is, what are the six types of simple machines? We have a lever, a wheel and axle, incline plane, wedge, screw, and a pulley. On top of that, we're also going to be looking at what determines the mechanical advantage of each of these types of simple machines. So let's go ahead and get started with a lever. So a lever, there are three types of levers. Okay, you're very familiar with these uh, in general, in the general uh, experience of life. You just may not realize it. Okay, so again, there's three class, three classes of these levers. All right, I want you to pay attention as you're trying to differentiate these three classes. Pay attention to number one, the fulcrum, the position of the fulcrum, and the direction of the forces. Notice here that the direction of the input force, the force that's applied by the person is on the far right or on the end anyways. So that's my input force or my input arm and then notice that the fulcrum is in between and then you have an output force. And the, um, the real life experience that best fits this particular type of lever is opening up a can of paint. Okay. Now let's look at the second class lever. Now let's look at second class and third class together. Again notice the position of the fulcrum. The fulcrum is on the outside of each of these. Okay and the force arms are on the on the uh, outside okay and the direction of the forces are also in the same direction right so your input force is up and so is your output force same thing with your third class lever same direction now so second class and third class have the same direction the, the input force and the output force are in the same direction and the fulcrum is on the outside but notice now that the output force and the second class lever is in the middle Let's call that the second position for the second class lever. So you notice your input force is on the outside and in between you have output force, the second position, and then your fulcrum. Now look at the third class. Third class, that output force is in the third position on the outside. Okay? So third class and second class levers have the fulcrum in the outside, right? And then your first class has it in the middle. And also notice that direction that the uh, force forces applied are in opposite direction, right? So your input force is in one direction and the output force is in the other. And again, notice the input and output forces are in the same direction, but the position of the output force is in the second position, output force is in the third position. So that the real life experience that best illustrates a second class lever will be a wheelbarrow. So just think of how you lift a wheelbarrow, you lift it up by the handles and the output force, that force is applied to the middle position and then your fulcrum, which would be your wheel, is on the outside. And then the third class lever, uh, third class lever is best illustrated by a broom, okay, sweeping up a floor. So the fulcrum is the position that's closest to your body, okay, that's the position, that's the fixed position, and then you're applying the force in the middle position, the second position, and then in the third positional force uh, is the output, that's where the work is being done. Okay, so that does it for levers. Oh, actually one other thing. So to identify or to quantify the ideal mechanical advantage, how much actual mechanical advantage you're applying, you want to divide the input arm by the output arm, okay, or the input force by the output force, okay. So the longer that the arm is, the longer that the arm is, the larger that numerator position will be the larger your mechanical advantage will be, the easier it will be. So if, if I kind of go back to my um, my first class lever, think of the screw that's opening up the can of paint. If you use a tiny little screw compared to a really long screw, that arm, that lever arm is going to be much longer with a longer screw and you'll be able to apply much more output force and it'll be easier for you to open that can of paint. Okay, so again, the formula would be input arm divided by output arm. All right, let's take a look at the second, the wheel and axle. Wheel and axle, uh, you'll be familiar with this in, uh, in the wheel and axle actually of a car, okay, the wheel, getting behind the wheel, driving a car. So when you think about the, uh, the wheel that you're maneuvering with your hands while driving a car, that radius is much larger, that radius is much larger than the radius of the actual axle that's going into the drive, sh the drive shaft itself that's going into the engine that uh, turns the wheels. Okay, another example would be a, uh, a handle, okay, on the doorknob. So you think of the wheel, the part, the position where you actually put your hand in and turn, and then you think about that connecting arm, 
okay that axle is much smaller than the radius of the wheel that in which you you uh, grip and turn okay so the larger the larger that radius is on the wheel okay the larger that radius is and the smaller the radius of the axle is the less work you actually have to do think of the car I mean can you imagine having think of all the weight that's on the wheels themselves okay so I mean this is power steering there's you know a whole set of technology that goes behind what makes turning a car so easy but uh, you think of the ratio of the wheel that you're turning and the wheel of the axle that's going in um, that creates an ad a mechanical advantage that allows you to turn um, the wheel much easier. Okay, so you would find this out by dividing input radius, the wheel, divided by output radius. Okay, so the larger the input radius, the larger that wheel radius is, the easier it's going to be to turn. Okay, all right. Let's look at inclined plane. Now, inclined plane we won't spend too much time on because we've actually discussed in a previous video. An inc inclined plane would be best illustrated by how you move things uh, from your house to, let's say, a moving truck. Okay, so imagine moving that wheelbarrow directly from the ground up to that uh, top plank position, the horizontal position. Okay, you would have to go against all the all the uh, gravitational force that's being applied to that wheelbarrow. Now, if you actually roll that wheelbarrow up the plank, up a, a inclined plane, the force, the gravitational force that's pushing the, the wheelbarrow down to the ground is actually being lessened. It's being distributed throughout the entire inclined plane. So the longer that the plane is, the more that force is being distributed, the less force you'll have to apply to uh, move that wheelbarrow from the ground up to where you want it. Okay. Now again, if you recall from the previous video when we talked about uh, mechanical advantage, the trade-off between this is that the distance is greater from ground to uh, to the horizontal position. So you kind of you kind of trade off the distance to the amount of force or work that you'll have to or just the force that you have to apply. Okay. So it's a lot easier to get that wheelbarrow up, but you have to travel a longer distance. Okay. And the longer that inclined plane is, the less the less force you have to apply. To get that wheelbarrow up to that position okay so if you recall this ideal mechanical advantage um, ratio distance along the plane divided by the change in height all right so the longer the distance the more ideal mechanical advantage you have the more that simple machine works in your favor the less work or the less force you have to apply okay so let's take a look now at wedge